I have a doctorate in mathematics from University of Texas in Arlington. My research interests were probability theory, stochastic analysis, and reliability. Um, that was what made me kind of stumble into the storage. Formerly research scientist for Dell, um, which is how I ended up in, in the Silicon Valley area. And one of the things that I would say I've noticed for a you know 30 second soapbox is because I'm a uh, I'm an old school mathematician. Not too many gray hairs, but I'm an old old school, old fashionedly trained mathematician. Not a huge fan of data science. Not a huge fan of machine learning. Um, I push for mathematical solutions, and there's a reason for that. Um, in particular, it's more interpretable, it's understandable, we actually know what's going on, um, and to use some, some friendly buzzwords, it scales. You know, I, uh, I can, I've never done any analysis for any company on anything bigger than a Mac Mini, never needed to. So with that, that's why I, I'm writing a few things on some new thoughts on anomaly detection. Now some of the new thoughts, it's, they're fairly new, um, and it was, this is an extension of some work borrowed from finance of all places, and of all places, finance has the anomaly detection stuff down, or you'd hope so, with all your credit cards. Um, so basically what this is going to be is a slight overview of what do we mean by an anomaly? What does that actually mean? It's used, what does it mean? What are some common methods of anomaly detection? Why are they insufficient? And then you're gonna get a little bit more of a lecture to why I asked if you're awake. So we're actually going to talk about some of the mathematics behind formal time series analysis, um, how we actually mathematically define outliers, and we're going to talk about univariate time series um, for this talk, keep it fairly simple. And then we're going to talk about, anyway, classifying those, some issues that kind of prevent this type of analysis from being more widely used, and why, how we're fixing it. And then finally, you know, at the end of all the mathematics, why do you care? Okay, so if I ask, if I just take a survey, I've done it on social media, you know, the Twitters, whatnot, what's an anomaly? If I just throw it out there, and honestly, I'll even see this in data science books, I'll see it in statistics books. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not picking on, on people, this is, this is everywhere, what's an anomaly? Give me one that's, you know, it's not normal, something that's out of the ordinary, something that's too different, something, you might even get really technical with me. Something that's outside an acceptable variance or tolerance. That's, that's a technical version of the first two. But what's the problem with all of those? They're relative definitions, right? So in mathematics, we would say this isn't well-defined. In other words, if I pick two people in this room, give you a series, and then give you a point outside, you know, something that might look weird. One of you might tell me that it looks way too weird. We should absolutely flag this, and this is a huge issue. The other person may not find that much cause for concern. They might not declare that anomalous. And if I asked you the criterion that you used, even the criterion, well, maybe I want to go three standard deviations away from the mean. Well, I want to go three and a half or so, something along those lines. It's not well defined. If I ask two different people and get two different answers, it's not well defined. And it's because this is a relative definition. If you want to define an anomaly, anomaly, it means you have to define normal first, and then we have to define what it means to depart from that. And that changes every time our data set changes, which is a problem. So just for some common methods and examples, I'm not even pulling these straight from a stat textbook that you might see you know, in like a stat 101 course. I'm pulling ones that companies in this valley are using right now. Um, Etsy. And I've implemented every one of these pieces of code, by the way. They, they are open source. You can, they actually put them out there um, for download. I've implemented every single one of these. The code's fancy, but all, that, all Etsy does is they find the mean, or uh, what they would consider the mean, whether it be a line, whether it be um, just a point, go three standard deviations away from the mean, anything outside of that is an anomaly. That's the one they would probably teach you in your STAT 101 course. I would flunk anyone in here who tried it. It's a terrible notion, especially for time series. Netflix calls theirs robust anomaly detection. So they basically try a matrix method. What they'll do is they'll take, take a data set, and this one can be done in multiple dimensions, and they'll take your data matrix and they'll decompose that into what they call a background or normal matrix and an anomaly matrix. So they use PCA to do that. What are some issues with that? Uh, one, PCA is not interpretable. It's great to deal with 
you know, multicollinearity and other problems you'd find in your data set. But once I run PCA and actually do some, say, some regression on those principal components, what do those coefficients mean anymore? Nothing. That's the coefficient that goes with this principal component, right? It's all a mishmash of all the data now that forms a nice orthogonal principal component. So Netflix does actually a good job when you implement it, um, but it's not very interpretable. It doesn't help me understand my system or whatever it is I'm trying to look at any better. Twitter. So Twitter uses essentially, so the extreme studentized deviate test is a fancy way of Etsy's, but they use some more robust statistics. Instead of a mean, they'll use a median, and a, an extreme studentized deviate uses um, departures from a median instead. And when they say seasonal hybrid, it means they window the data and just kind of do it in chunks. So it's a fancier Etsy. Google Analytics picks up the Bayesian stuff. We all love Bayesian stuff. Problem with Google Analytics is that it requires a 90-day training period to look for daily outliers. You have to run this algorithm for 90 days consecutively before it has learned enough to start trying to hopefully flag outliers to occur once a day. If you want to look at weekly outlier detection in your time series, you know maybe your data is on a weekly basis, you need 32 weeks. I don't know, I was in the Bay Area not too long, but I know you guys don't have that kind of time to train that stuff. All of these are essentially based on the same philosophy, which I, as a mathematician, have a bit of a problem with. So Netflix, uninterpretable. Um, Etsy and Twitter, actually, the seasonal hybrid ESD, again, um, if I had a stat student in one of my stat classes turn in something like that on a time series, they get some serious points off. This is absolutely inappropriate for time series. It treats all data points as being independent and drawn from the same distribution, which is not true for time series. So it violates the assumption of what a time series actually is. And Google Analytics is just slow. Ninety days. Well, you need data for ninety days. So what the Google Analytics is for? Well, it depends. If you already have the data set, yes. But if you're going to run it on, say, your WordPress site, and you want to look at analytics on who's coming to your site and maybe flag anomalous things. Once you install it on your WordPress, it needs 90 days to get used to it before it can start flying. So it depends, yes. If you already have the data set, it would converge very quickly. But if you're looking to implement this on something streaming, it's a lot worse. So to back up, when I said something's inappropriate for time series, I should probably define what I mean. So what exactly is a time series? Things get weird when time is our independent variable. So. A statistician would tell you that a time series is simply a set of observations, and we'll denote that by little x t. Little x, um, I'm going to denote by actual observations. We've seen them, they've been observed. And they're recorded at specific times. Now, for a prob as a probabilist, what I would look at and say, every time you give me a time series, that is a possible realization of a random process that occurs in sequence, and the sequence is being indexed by time. So for example, as, as a pretty simple option, every stock price. That's a time series. So here's the Tesla closing stock price, at least from when I made these slides. And you can probably note when a very strange tweet went out and what happened to that stock price. Um, now, I made the slides too early to show how much it came back down from that, because that would actually serve as a really useful illustration of a type of time series anomaly. Um, but we've defined what this formally means. So when we say it's a realization of a random process, this isn't the same thing as, say, drawing you know, a pile of data from a bucket, right? So we're not sampling from a distribution. This is something that we're actually seeing occur over time. And one of those things that we have to occur to deal with is that time affects things, right? We can't assume independence, that if something happens today and something happens tomorrow, we can't assume that these two points are independent anymore. So what we would do in mathematics is look at a classical decomposition model. Some of you in data science have probably seen this before. And what I have here is I'm taking a time series, a big XT. So this is a random variable. We haven't observed anything yet. This is just existing as a random variable or a random series. So what we have is a trend component. That's little m of t. That would be you know, maybe overall the stock is linearly increasing or quadratically or exponentially is what you hope, but whatever, right? It's some kind of deterministic function that's a trend. S of t, so sometimes what can happen, especially, like I said, a lot of this was really developed um, in mathematical finance, what you see a lot of times in stock prices, you'll see seasonality. Um, you'll see, you know, sometimes your inventory decreases a whole bunch at Christmas time, 
and you need a huge uptick in seasonal employees over time. So that time series, you'd see seasonal spikes every December in, say, sales if you're Amazon. So we actually break that out into its own component, that we have to account for the fact that they're seasonal. It's still a deterministic in a sense, is what we would, we would assume, but it's different than what's the overall trend here. And that last guy right there, Y of T, is the thing we're going to focus on. That's what makes time series weird. So this is what we call a stationary random noise component. And it, mostly from a technical standpoint, what that means is as my time series evolves with those two, first two deterministic components, that last term can be thought of a little bit like the error terms in regression, except it's a random process itself. That's what's giving you your volatility or your variation in your time series. And that thing does not obey the laws of STAT 101. It will not. So when we say it's stationary, it's a mathematical assumption that our statistical properties are time invariant. So that helps make the math easier. So like I said, this isn't so different than, than regression. In fact, if you look at that, that's a linear decomposition. Right? This isn't very different from regression at all, except for one major thing, which is why I picked on Twitter and Etsy, which is that the error terms behave very differently. The assumptions that, are, that they used in, in their approach, and a lot of people use in their approach, fundamentally violate the assumptions of what happens in time series errors. So what we really need to do after we've figured out how to break this apart where we really want to focus is on modeling that noise. This is actually really, really important. This is what's telling you the volatility. This is what's telling you how to set your options prices. This is what's telling you, you know, how is this random process affecting what would otherwise be a fully deterministic series? This is what's giving us our randomness. And so what we do is we model the noise essentially, and again, this is also linear. This is a linear model. And we model it as a function of, here is my yt. That's an error term at time point t. And that thing is a function of everything that came before it, or some set that came before it. And it's also a function of a white noise process. That's just totally random crap. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it, but it's random, and I have to put it in there. So, this process, this random process evolves in a linear, so I can move all those yt minus ones over to the other side and basically say that yt is equal to essentially a function of previous lags of itself and a white noise process that is observed at time t and previous lags of it. And those coefficients in front are going to tell me how much of an effect each of those have. Like I said, this is actually very similar to what linear regression looks like. We're just calling these terms something a little bit different. Our goal here, which is a lot um, more challenging, we'll say, than, say, linear regression, is we want to estimate this process to understand how these noise terms affect the model. And this gets complicated, right? When I say going to t minus p, how many lags actually affect my current point? Ooh. How many, do I even have a white noise part? Yeah, most likely, yes, you do. Um, but then how many lags of it do I need, right? I'm looking at two different processes, like the lags of itself and this effect of this other process and lags of it. So this is a lot more complicated to model. So in practice, the reason it's not typically adopted in, in industry, it is actually very, very difficult with real data to deal with. R has packages if, uh, is R even still a fad now? I mean, I feel like, yeah, most people use Python, but it, at any rate, you know, R's got packages to, to deal with this. You know, people run an auto dot arima, and yay, it gives you something. But what is it actually doing? Actually, that's very difficult to do. It doesn't give you the results that you'd hope for. And if I actually were going to sit there and focus on one time series, trying to find out the model of those error terms, I could spend weeks on it. And obviously, we don't have that kind of time. So we, we try to write algorithms to estimate it for us. But this is difficult. And it is a bit of an art using what was called an autocovariance function. So it's basically looking at the correlation between your current point and lags of both your current series and that white noise process and saying, OK, well, the covariance is high enough to say that this is probably a significant effect. When I say it's kind of in art, like we're kind of, yes, there is a bit of a judgment call here. That's what makes this a little bit difficult. So modeling in practice is difficult. I think that's why it hasn't been adopted. Um, some of these algorithms are very difficult to implement. They get kind of sensitive. And that's kind of what we'll talk about. So where do the outliers come in? I haven't even addressed that yet. So we've, great, we've got, a, we've got a random process and we've got complicated noise terms. Now what? Now what happens if I have an outlier in my series? Some point that's just is a huge spike. 
Is it an outlier? What is it? Is that just part of the volatility? I don't know. So let's talk about it. So if I take a process, and like I said, again, we've taken the deterministic parts of our time series and thrown them aside. Yay, we don't care anymore. What I care about now is dealing with these error terms, this volatility. If we have essentially a, a process that looks like this, then we can have different events. And so I'm not going to say outliers anymore. I'm going to say there are different events that influence the series at specific points in time to produce a new series. So I'm going to call that new series yt star. And at, this is essentially just the mathematical structure of it. And we'll pick it apart. The last, I'm going to start right to left. The indicator function, I'm going to see if I can not poke anyone in the eye with a laser pointer. Here we go. All right, so that indicator function here, all it tells me is give me a t prime, some point in time. And at that point in time, exactly, the indicator function will light up with a big one that you multiply this whole term by if we're at this point in time. If it's, we're not at that point in time, this term is zero and everything goes away. So at this point in time, what's going to happen is there's going to be a structure here that is a function of your original series, as a polynomial of your original series, and then out here is essentially how much effect does this have? So basically what this is telling me is how much am I screwing up my current time series to produce a new one? So at time t, or at time t prime, how much am I actually changing my series? And does that change propagate? Does it have an effect on the future? So types of interventions, pictures and signals help. So the first one, we would call it an additive outlier intervention. So, uh, finance calls it an intervention. So what this is, is the structure of what was before. So remember, we have new series. We have the old series, and here is the structure that we care about. Different outliers have different structures. The first structure is just one. So what does that actually mean? This is the only thing I would ever call a true outlier. It affects a single point in time, and it never occurs again. It is a total one-off. It's weird. I don't know what it is, and I don't care. Maybe it was just weird. It never, never did anything. So what that signal would be is at, say, point 10, you would just see whatever that omega is, just a constant omega you add to that t prime. That's it. Just shift it up. And that's it. And it goes away. This one, this one's the one you hope your stocks do, at least if this is going up. So this structure looks like this, where this is a backwards operator. Like I said, I was trying not to make it too much of a math lecture, but the pictures are what we really care about here. This is a permanent vertical shift in your time series. So there's a point in time at which my time series is going along nice and happy, including its volatility. And there's a point in time right here where the entire series makes a big jump. Well, a little jump. Depends on the omega, right? Makes a jump. And that jump is permanent. Never goes away. Could be up, could be down, could be whatever. That's a level shift. Notice we've actually, and we've defined all of these. So we don't care that much about something's off, right? We're not saying some, we're not defining this relative to the series anymore. We've actually shifted. This thing has a definition outside of it. And it's telling us what's actually happening in our series. This is a permanent shift. Maybe this is a good thing. Maybe this is a bad thing. But it's really nice to know that it has an effect. All right, so this one is kind of the we'll call it level shift light. This is a temporary change. Notice this has the same structure, except what we have is this little delta here. This is a permanent jump in the time series here, but that effect will decay over time. So this is where I'm gonna bring up that Tesla example. So when Elon Musk sent that tweet out, whatever it was, August 7th or something, about taking Tesla private, what happened to the stock? It jumped up a bunch. So if you're a trader that day, the question you want to ask yourself, that, that's, that's the clearest example of something is different in this series now, you know, big time. That is an outlier from what was previous behavior. Is it this or this? Is it going to decay? So probably some people traded hoping it was this one. Probably some people bought hoping it was this one. And if you look at the stock prices later, it's more like this. It decayed. But the point is, we can actually look at that time series, and yes, after enough time, we can actually go back and find the point at which that series changed, either permanently or temporarily. So we would call it an intervention. You can call it an anomaly if you like, but that point made a change in the series, and that's what we're ultimately interested in outlier detection. What happened? Is it weird? And is that important? Is the last question that just flagging something doesn't tell you. All right, and the last one is just because we're mathematicians and we like making things weird. This one, 
This structure, notice that nothing really changed. This isn't particularly descriptive, and that's because it is totally possible for me to insert a series inside of another series and completely screw up your stuff. And this has an initial impact. This one has effects that linger over observations, not just time. The other ones here all had a time effect to it. Either it was permanent or it decayed, or it was a, just a one-off thing. This one, this one can do almost nothing at first. Maybe then it'll pop up later. Maybe it'll go away. Maybe it'll do something, give you a signal kind of like this. Maybe it's a signal kind of like this. And it's all based on yet another ARIMA process I'm inserting at that point in time. So I'm mixing series now. And like I said, because we're mathematicians, we like making things weird. What happens if you do this? Um, as far as detection goes, and we'll talk about that, this one, while you know, maybe from a practical perspective, if you've got something that's really screwing up your series, like say you're monitoring some metric in your data center, and you want to know if this is really going to wreak havoc on your data center, and it's going to show up as not as time goes on, but as people use the system more. This is the outlier you'd want. This is the hardest one to detect because it requires modeling the innovational outlier as well. But it is still ha does still have a mathematical definition. So it's a great model. We, we've defined things formally now. Everything's well defined. There's no relative definitions. And if I know exactly what my ARMA process is and I just write out the math for it, it's beautiful, right? My board work is so pretty. And now the engineer looks at me and says, well, please implement this for my data set. That's, that's the hard part. So the implementation that's currently out there um, that I've worked with, there might be one in Python or some of these other ones, deals with a paper that was published in 1989 that it attempted to create a way, because what's the hardest part of dealing with any data set that with outliers? One, you have to model it. Two, you have to find the outliers. We're doing that at the same time because we don't know what we're dealing with going in. We're going in blind. So we have to model and detect outliers at the same time knowing nothing. So what this tried to do was it would create a loop. The first loop would model, try to model the data, try to look for that ARIMA model. And then the second loop and then it would detect outliers, right? So we'd, we'd model, we'd get an ARIMA model, and then it'd go through and assuming that ARIMA model was true, let's see if I can find and classify some of those outliers we just talked about. It'll flag maybe four or five points, pull them out, classify them. Now what it's gonna do is run an outer loop with those points eliminated. Is everything still okay? If not, it'll pull those points back in. Oops, I falsely classified an outlier. So what ends up happening in practice is that certain types of data sets with very regular patterns. So I would say, imagine um, like watching a heartbeat monitor. It's pretty flat and then you'll see a big spike. Pretty flat, you'll see a big spike. And it's very regular. What would actually happen is, and I crashed my computer doing this, it will, the loop will never end. It throws those spikes out as outliers and then goes, oops, that's actually a pattern. I need to put that back in, that's part of the model. And then it tries again, oops, those are outliers and now I'm putting it back in. And so for a lot of types of data sets, this gets stuck. It also has issues with convergence and if you dig into the code, it makes a few, the implementation makes a few assumptions that you have to kind of tweak and adjust or know to tweak and adjust if your data set's particularly high granularity, say millisecond or second data. So there's a lot of complicated issues in that. So what ended up happening is the next question is, well, the, the paper, you know, your paper's pretty, the math is pretty, it looks great on a board. I can't get the code to work and I can't run it on my data sets. And I, I especially don't have three weeks to model this and detect outliers. So forget it, go to the machine learning, just run something. I need this to work and I need it to work now. So my philosophy here is it's not the math's fault it's not working. It's not the math's fault, it's not working, and it's not the computer science's fault. It's not the computer scientist's fault. It's not like he's implementing it poorly. I don't think that's the case either. What I think we're dealing is we're trying to do too much complicated stuff with too little data. So what's an option? So what do we do about it? What are a couple options we could do about it? Well, you could smooth the series. Yep. No, I would, no. This is actually a structure. The error terms, the random process that governs the Y is not the outlier. That's an error term as if it were in regression. We wouldn't call error terms outliers. They're simply vari variation. I wouldn't say, 
I don't like the, to use cause as the outlier. We model the occurrence of outliers in that random process. Right. Exactly. So it is whatever you capture the <laughs> y of t is relative to m and s. How, okay. What is the space? What is the space of m and s? And what do you uh, capture in that? Whatever is left over might be captured in y of t and a portion of y cross. In practice, yes, I agree with you. Um, when we're actually talking about the model, we don't assume that. We assume that the random process x of t is governed by two deterministic components and one random component. In practice, when we have to model and detect, I agree with you. So there's a couple things we can do if we have an overly complicated problem or two levels of an overcomplicated problem. If our series is kind of complicated, what can we do? We can smooth it out, right? We've got really high volatility in our data. We can smooth it a little bit. That might make our modeling a little bit simpler. Problems with smoothing, little bitty outliers that actually would have a really big effect later get smoothed over. Now we're not gonna find them anymore. So there's a few other problems. So this one is where I kind of stumbled on what some people would say is kind of a radical mathematical solution. And I want to push this a little bit further, and we'll actually talk about what we mean. So in 2013, there was a paper that discussed the transformation of financial time series, talk about volatile high granularity data, and they aggregated that in the form of Japanese candlesticks. We'll talk about that too. And we transformed this into a totally new, I'm going to call it a number space, but that's not totally accurate to call it a number space, but it's a set space, but we're totally going to transform it into a totally new space on fuzzy numbers. Then what they did is given that space now, these objects of fuzzy numbers, I can do the exact same thing that I did with ARIMA. I'm just doing it on these objects. Simplified the time series estimation, and they had better predictive ability, which is really good for finance people. They like when you say things like that. So let's actually pick this apart and talk about this approach and why I in particular like it and am actively working on it. So hopefully if you have seen these, ignore the slide. If you haven't, brief overview. So a Japanese candlestick is essentially a box and whisker plot of um, you know, whatever window you want to look at for your finance. And what you'll have is you'll have at the top, let me grab my little thing here. We have a closed price, that's this line here, and an open price. So this is telling you the difference between open and closed price. It has the lowest price traded, the highest price traded. And the way it's shaded, either green or red, or open or closed, depending on how they draw it, is not only telling you the delta between open and closed price, but it's telling you the movement of the stock. What direction are we going? So if we actually take each one of these for whatever window we want to smooth our time series a little bit, we get a candlestick chart. And now we can actually see that it was, in general, kind of trending up, but whoops, we had you know, despite the overall trend, we had a little issue right here. So it gives you a lot of information while still aggregating data. And this has actually been used, I mean, this, this notion of Japanese candlesticks, hundreds of years old, and it's used in finance quite a lot. Now what we can do is get a little bit mathematical with it. So now we get to jump from stat to pure math. So what's a fuzzy number? So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is a fuzzy set, and it's pretty intuitive. So if, I'm a typical set, like say, the set of integers. You're either an integer or you're not an integer. You're in the set or you're out, yes or no, right? Binary inclusion, you're in or you're out. That's not really that appropriate for a lot of situations. If I open that door and I put one foot outside of the door and I have one foot inside of the door, on the other side of the door, am I in the room or out of the room? Well, kind of a little bit of both, right? And if I kind of just stick a toe out and have most of my body in the room, I'm more in the room than out of the room, but still not totally in the room. That's a fuzzy set. What we do is we allow partial membership to a set. And that's what a fuzzy number ultimately is. It's the notion of a fuzzy set, but we put some more restrictive conditions because we have to define arithmetic on these really kind of weird sets. And so what we have is instead of a membership function as a binary, I'm in or I'm out, one or zero, this membership function can actually look a little bit like, well, like a function. And this, what this is going to tell me is, what am I? Well, I'm currently sitting at one. Am I, how in the set am I? On a scale from zero to one, right? What percentage in am I? So if we look at this green guy here, and I, this defines a nice little trapezoid right here. If I'm at, say, one right here, and I follow up to see where it, uh, that intersects the green line. I'm about half in the set, I think. My angle's kind of weird. I'm about half in the set. And if I'm at two, 
if I'm actually between one and a half and two and a half, I'm all the way in the set. So we aren't just, you know, in or out, we, we have, and we can change the shape of the membership function, right? So now if I decide, well, I want the fuzzy set, they all these have the same center, but I want the fuzzy set to have a different membership function. One is kind of not, one's not in here anymore. I can define these in all sorts of weird, different ways. So a fuzzy number is essentially a fuzzy set that's centered around a particular number. All of these are different examples of a fuzzy two. Now two is not just two objects anymore, it's a set centered at two. And as it turns out, fuzzy two in the green trapezoid actually includes, completely includes one and a half and two and a half, not just two. We don't have to only put the center at that one point. So we have a lot of options and as mathematicians, we like this sort of thing. I've basically expanded the notion of what it means to be a two. And it, not only have I expanded that notion, but I've, I can change what it even looks like to be a two. Why do we care? Other than just this is kind of cool and you can do some really interesting arithmetic with it. So because these things are defined by membership functions, I can now do arithmetic on them. I can add them, I can subtract them, I can multiply them, I can divide them, although the latter two are very, they're not intuitive. So adding two fuzzy numbers is fairly intuitive. Subtracting them is fairly intuitive. Multiplying and dividing them get really weird. But you can do it. The point is we can do it. So why do we care? What does this have to do with anomalies? What does it have to do with, what does it have to do with anything? Okay, so the idea that I have an issue with when it comes to smoothing time series is whenever you smooth, you lose information. If I take a mean, if I have a set of 10 data points and then give you the mean, tell you to calculate the mean, you still know what those original 10 points are. If I take those points away, give you a mean, you have no way to tell me what, and I even said there are 10 points, x1 through x10, and the mean of them is five. You have no way to tell me what those original points were. I have no way to recover the information I've lost by aggregating it. That's a problem. It's a huge problem, especially when you want to take this volatility into account. Not li life is not steady state, so we can't model it that way. So what this does is because we can create these fuzzy numbers with different shapes, I can aggregate information around a center, which we can kind of abuse terms and call a mean here a little bit. And instead of just assuming a variance, right, a constant variance across the whole series, which in itself is a bit of an assumption and an aggregation, each little bit has its own shape. And each little bit has its own shape. So I can keep the volatility in a window of data and still aggregate it. I'd, I don't lose any, S, any information at all. I can clump the data. And like I said, I, this isn't a, a math or algorithms lecture, but there is an algorithm to, to actually take data and estimate the function, the membership functions that I showed you with the, the other more simple example. And that's how you transform data to fuzzy candlesticks. The best part about this is there exists a functional to transform it back. I can always put it back. So instead of giving you a mean and that's it, and all you have is like, well, I don't know what the data is now. I just know the center of it. Even a mean and a variance, you still can't tell me that much. I can put all of it back. What's cool about this is because I can do arithmetic on fuzzy numbers that are now basically objects, we can think of them a little bit, like I said, abusive notation, but a little bit like little probability distributions on Windows. Now, they, they don't integrate to one, that's why they're not probability distributions, but each one of them, so you'll see different shapes. This is where I wish I had a whiteboard, but you'll see different little shapes. You know, this window has a tiny variance, it's very highly centered, this one's way spread out. And when you look at your time series, instead of maybe saying a band of variance, you'll see that volatility is still modeled in there. But we've moved to a far simpler space of objects to deal with. I can create the same autoregressive model, and I, for simplicity, I'm leaving out the white noise process because fuzzy white noise actually has not been invented yet. We don't know what that means yet. Um, working on it. What does that actually mean? So what we have here, I put bars other than to signify that now these aren't just points in time. These aren't singular points. These are objects. And I can treat them just like a time series and model them linearly, because this is a linear model just on its own lags, plus some error term here. Like I said, I'm actually going back to just linear regression. It's just, it's just on its own lags. So I can simplify the model. And the 2014 paper, they actually um, implemented this and then did a follow-up numerical study. They took some very highly volatile time series, particularly in currency exchanges, and they found they had better predictive results. And I think it was something like 
30 or 40 percent higher returns by modeling their series using a fuzzy autoregressive model and then forecasting off that than they did with a standard ARIMA model. So you have better predictability, which I'm just looking at that signifying means your model's better. And they stopped. Haven't actually seen anything cite this since. So that's kind of where we started coming in. They stopped. Autoregressive is just linear on your lags on these objects. Well, when we want to integrate and you know, put a moving average in there, again, that's where it's like, what does it mean to have fuzzy white noise? What if I take a white noise process, window it, and transform it into a fuzzy number? Now I can recreate what we had before, that whole big long polynomial in terms of two different processes into a fuzzy space, model that now, and now I've actually kept the volatility while aggregating the data. Because those interventions are defined essentially as backwards operators of an ARIMA process, the intervention definitions actually would generalize, they, they wouldn't change at all. We are just operating on a different space. So my theory is that the, the complexity that's involved in modeling highly volatile time, time series and trying to pull out anomalous points can be fixed by simplifying the space while not losing data. This is where we would come in and how this would basically work is if you have a fuzzy ARIMA model and a fuzzy TSO algorithm, what it would do is it would flag windows, right? It would flag a fuzzy number as an anomaly, but because we are able to transform it back via, essentially, basically via a functional, I can basically, now this is the window I focus on. Now all I have to do is, you, human can inspect a window like that and find what the issue is. So, like I said, I also am one of those old-fashioned mathematicians that don't think the computer should make all the decisions. I do want humans to ultimately be the ones to make the call. This is a mathematical solution. What's nice about this is even though I transform to a space that looks kind of odd, these coefficients are still very interpretable. I know what they mean. I know that means this is how much of a fuzzy effect, essentially a fuzzy number effect this has on this, right? I may have changed the space, but I haven't changed the meaning of anything. And I can move seamlessly, back. well, I say seamlessly. Like I said, it looks nice on paper, implementing it's a whole different story. That's why the research is there. But I can move back and forth between these two spaces in a way that we haven't been able to do before. All right. Why do you care? Other than just this is a really cool mathematical project that I find particularly interesting and maybe you do too. Okay, well, we don't always have bandwidth to send a whole bunch of data back. We aren't, you aren't always allowed to collect that much data. People are getting kind of picky about that stuff these days. Um, you wanna be able to model things more simply with less data. You wanna be able to do it faster. You don't want 90 days to train a model. You want to be able to detect things and classify them. It's not enough to just put a flag up and say, hey, please go look at it and send your poor customer support person to please go look at it and look, okay, it's a flag, I'm looking at it, what? You know, saying like, hey, this, what I've seen here, and obviously we, you know, build this out into recommendations, but hey, what I've seen here is this is a level shift with a 79% probability. This looks like it's a permanent change in this metric, and we also happen to know that a, cha a permanent change in this metric that doesn't seem to be dropping is indicative of an imminent failure. But if you can't classify it, you can't finish the statement. All right, what I'm ultimately going for is we all wanna do stuff at the edge, right? We're tired of sending large amounts of data back. And we wanna do edge computing. The last thing you need is your self-driving car needing to, whoops, I gotta send a whole bunch of data back and the link's kinda of broken and now I'm not gonna break and yeah, We gotta do a bunch of stuff at the edge. To me, that doesn't mean adding more computational power into your edge devices. That means being smarter about how you compute. Restrictions are a good thing. It means we get clever. Um, and since, yeah, we're actually not doing good time. So um, the note at the end, which pretty much concludes the talk, is that we work a little bit, um, a little bit differently than how a university would work. Although universities do things like IP sharing and whatnot, you can't patent math. Nobody can patent a Markov process. What we can do is patent applications. And our deal, because we're mathematicians, we create mathematics. We work with engineers, and out of those come applications in IP. And funding institutions keep the IP. Patents are yours. Take them, have fun, implement them, make tons of money off them. Um, because that's how we do it, 
we only let one company claim a project at a time because I don't want to deal with lawyers. Um, that's just a little bit of how we work. But in um, kind of the last takeaway here is I really, and I'll, I, I guess I'll probably say this till I'm blue in the face, I think there's going to come a reckoning. We've got to stop just throwing blind computation at things. We have to get clever. We have to go back. It was a good thing when we actually had restrictive computation. You had to, you better get that punch card right because it's going to be a it's going to be a process to fix it. That wasn't a bad thing. It means we created methods that were robust. They're provable. They last. That's how I work. That's how I prefer to work. And that's essentially why we work on stuff like this. So I guess with that, that was pretty much a giant overview of like five different topics. So.